Hello, Kennard Park Community Church. How are you today? This is Pastor Robin for any of you new people here. And uh, just going to meet in the foyer here at 9.55 a.m. And uh, meet and greet. Say hi. See how you're all doing. Had a good week. How about you? How has your week been? How has your week been? Just waiting to see if some people sign in here with us and join us this morning as we gather for worship. This is what we call the virtual foyer, pre-service greeting. <laughs> I was uh, reading this morning in Luke's gospel and I was coming to the end of chapter one, I believe. And I was just reading about how, reading um, the response of the people to the conception and the birth of uh, John the Baptist, his parents, uh, um, Zachariah and Elizabeth, uh, named him John, yes, of course. And um, good morning, Val. And as uh, people were just thinking about everything that had happened uh, to bring John the Baptist into the world, the vision in the temple, Zechariah being muted by an angel because he lacked some faith and had some doubt in this promise. Um, hey, happy birthday from my sister, Elisa. Good to see you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone from Norm and Gail. Awesome. Good morning. Good morning to everybody who is signing in so far. Anyway, the community just responded in this amazing way as they, here is, here is, here is John the Baptist, this baby that's born, and they think of the miraculous circumstances surrounding it, and they saw, and they were just wondering, what is this boy going to be? Because the hand of the Lord was with him. And so that's an amazing statement. And uh, we might be tempted to think that maybe the hand of the Lord is only with those who are going to be famous and very, very special in the story of God. And that's not the case at all. The, the hand of the Lord is with all of us. You know, God has put us all on this earth and this planet for a reason. He's brought us all into this world to know him, to worship him, to glorify him, to give our lives to him. And his hand is with each one of us. Even if we never have a book written about us, even if we never have a movie made about us, the hand of the Lord is with us. Yes, there are those people who are selected for these very important positions and roles. But just want you to know this morning that the hand of the Lord is with you, even if it feels like it's not. Just think about what John the Baptist had to go through. He had to live in the wilderness, out in the desert. And when he uh, finally came in for his public ministry among the people of Israel, he faced opposition. He faced arrest. He was imprisoned. And then he was beheaded. So the hand of the Lord was with him. And so if you're going through hard times, you think God is just not with you. He is. His hand is with you and he's using you. We just have to recognize that and see that. So I hope today you feel that the hand of the Lord is with you and that you can trust in him. Hey, thank, hey good morning, Jim. Good morning, Kimberly. Happy Mother's Day, to, she's saying to everybody. Good morning, Randy. Good morning, Jim. Thank you for the birthday wishes, Jim. And uh, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers, to Cordy, Valerie, Elisa, Jim, Kimberly, and a bunch of you others who have signed in here this morning. Good to see you all. Happy Mother's Day to my own mother. I hate, I shouldn't be using the pulpit to do my own personal work here, but uh, <laughs> happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers equally. And we'll just letting more people uh, sign in here uh, before we officially begin and give our official greeting. We'll give another minute or so for that for people to sign in. Uh, so I imagine there'll be some people signing in just a little bit after 10 o'clock because that's kind of what we do. But good morning to everybody. Hope you've had a great week. I've had an interesting week here. We've had painters here painting our house. And uh, I got involved to try and cut the cost and take care of a few tasks. And wow, that really uh, filled my week up. And of course, uh, when you're trying to do these jobs, uh, everything that can go wrong tends to go wrong. And uh, but anyways, it's getting done. It's just made for a crazy week, but the house is looking so much better and the, the wood's being repainted so it doesn't rot out. So it's been a good full week for me. And uh, uh, what a way to, way, way to uh, either, you guys, you can look at Sunday as ending the week or beginning the week. I guess for now, we'll just look at it as this is a great way to end the week with Mother's Day. 
I always see Sunday as the first day of the week. But anyway, I guess that's Monday for us. But here we are. What a great way to end the week with uh, Mother's Day. What a highlight. So why don't we just take this opportunity here now at uh, 10.01 on Apple time to officially begin. So hello, Kennard Park Community Church. Hello to visitors and those who are signing in with us from wherever you may be at. We're glad that you are here. We especially want to um, uh, say hello to all mothers there. We want to wish you a uh, happy Mother's Day. And so just uh, praying that you have a great day today. And uh, we know that you know things don't always go well, but we're hoping and praying that you feel blessed in the Lord, regardless of where you're at and what you're experiencing. I just want you to listen to the Word of God and see how blessed we are for our mothers. Her, and this is from Proverbs 31, 28 to 31. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. So I just hope that we can take that to heart and appreciate our mothers today. Goes on to say, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And uh, I think we need to do praise our mothers in that regard. I think when we do that, we acknowledge the image of God in them. We acknowledge the work of God in them and through them to us. And it goes on to end the proverb in this way, give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. So let's, you know, what an amazing paradigm for all women. Uh, really, we men can learn from this as well. If you read through uh, Proverbs 10, uh, 31, 10 to 31, you're going to see a very, very, in, a picture of a very, very industrious woman. And we can all learn from that. Anyways, uh, we are truly blessed by you, our mothers. So we're just glad for you. Very, very glad for you. And uh, why don't we move on here this morning to some, some family news and uh, announcements. Uh, Sunday worship taking place here. Uh, this will be on YouTube by 1 p.m., hopefully. Uh, next Sunday, Elder John Bachman will be bringing part two in the doctrine of the church. So I'm looking for, forward to that. I hope you are looking forward to that. Pray for him. Pray for the people that we uh, come together and we hear and we receive some very, very important teaching about the church. It's, we have to know who we are, who God has called to be and what that means to center around and follow Jesus as his people. So John has begun a several part series that will probably take him through the summer and he'll be up at, uh, at least once a month, maybe a little more uh, as we get ready to move there and probably need some help filling pulpit. But uh, look forward to that this coming Sunday. Pray for him. Uh, pray for everybody. Uh, just the Holy Spirit will prepare us for that time of special teaching. We have weekly prayer meeting every Tuesday at 9 p.m. through the app called WhatsApp. It's a really good time to, to connect in in the week and just pray together. Uh, and so let us know if you want to be a part of that. Uh, KP Thursday night live every Thursday at 7 p.m. So join us for a lively discussion on things that matter. And, uh, you know, pressing us to think deeper on some things we need to think deeper on and just simply to have fun. So invite others and uh, to join us on that as well as for Sunday morning. Uh, you can sign up for a Zoom, an online Zoom community group. We, uh, uh, last week, my community group uh, broke from the normal study discussion routine, and we had a fun night, a crazy hairdo contest. And uh, Jarvis and Kimberly Braun won that competition. Very, very classy, very tasteful. And uh, but it was we 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 nearly we, it was a close call there because uh, Leanne and I had some pretty crazy hairdos going on as well. Anyway, we're looking for enough interest to begin a second Zoom uh, CG, so let us know if you are interested. Continue to pray for uh, Morris York and his wife, Marilyn, as she helps him recover from, heart, uh, from, from bypass heart surgery. Just check out our church family newsletter for more and sign up so that you're not missing out on anything. So let's take this opportunity here together to worship the Lord in prayer. Just remember, worship isn't only when we're singing. You know, there isn't the praise and worship section of the worship service where we're just singing. We are worshiping him together as we're going over family news. We are going to worship him in prayer. We're going to worship him in the word of God, and we're going to worship him in song. So let's do that today. Uh, good morning. Good morning. More people are signing in, but let's uh, take this opportunity here to bow our heads in prayer. Father, we just want to thank you for every good thing that you've given to us in Christ Jesus, and we thank you that in Christ Jesus you have given us mothers. We love our mothers. We thank you for them, Father God. And we just pray for your rich blessing upon them today uh, to bring them just rest and comfort and peace and joy today. 
Uh, just help every mother to see the good work that you have done in them and through them today because sometimes we can get discouraged in the way the world is and so we pray for a deep encouragement to our mothers we'd all give them a ring on the phone if we haven't done so yet and just bless them and uh, and show our uh, express our appreciation and love toward them father we pray for our church family we pray for our church we also think of the imagery in the bible of how the church can be like our mother and so we want to pull that theme out and just thank you that we have a church that nurtures us like a mother nurtures us in the gospel. And we just pray for your blessing upon Kennard Park Community Church and every church in Castlegar this morning, that uh, Lord Jesus, you would be seen and beheld and worshiped and known and tasted uh, and just fill people up today, draw them to yourself and fill them up with your good things today. Father, we pray for our town for our cities, for our, our for the communities and the neighborhoods in which we live. that We know that your Holy Spirit is at work in people's lives. We know that there are those who are submitting to that work and there are those who are resisting it. We just pray you would continue your good work and use us in whatever capacity that people would encounter you through word and deed, uh, through your people, even this week, uh, that more would be drawn and opened up uh, uh, to you, Lord Jesus. Father, we just pray for our country and the world in which we live. It is a fallen world. It is a fallen country. These are hard times with this pandemic that is still hard upon us. We are praying that you will ease off, Father, uh, that you will you will roll this up, uh, this, this virus back and uh, uh, restore some of our freedoms and our liberties that we enjoy, especially the one of being able to gather together as your people. Uh, we think of all the small businesses, Father, that are taken to huge hit and some of them and maybe many of them will not be able to open again we pray for provision for those people who are gonna have to figure out how to pick up the pieces of their life and what to do next father we just pray again we just lift up this world before you that you would uh, just Lord God just undo this virus and uh, renew your people renew this world in that way we just pray for Jesus in this time to be sought and found by all and we just pray that you would meet with us this morning father meet with us uh, our Father, we thank you that you have loved us and just open our hearts and our ears to what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, um, we are going to try something new this morning, this Sunday morning, right after the sermon though. And uh, this is very special. Uh, David and his daughter Katrina recorded a song for us to sing along with. So we're going to now try and step up our game a bit and incorporate a song that was recorded on an iPhone. So don't expect studio quality here, okay? That would not be fair. But what you're going to hear is something beautiful and extremely heartwarming. I listened to it like a dozen times and just moved my heart to worship. But they're gonna, we're going to have a, a, a very short song. And what you will need to do is, if you don't know the song, uh, which, which, which is um, The Steadfast Love of the Lord, you will need to Google the lyrics. I was meant to have a note in the order of service that was emailed out to you, but when I was going through, for some reason, I accidentally deleted it and it's not there, but Google the lyrics for The Steadfast Love of the Lord. And uh, it's just a very short song uh, that's repetitive. And so if you can't find that, that's okay. Just listen and sing along. And you might already know that by heart, but we're going to have them uh, uh, worked into the live stream. They pre-recorded this. So I'm looking forward to that. And just thank you for the Leffelars for making that possible. And so just be ready with those lyrics. And uh, what we'll do is we'll end this. We'll, 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 we'll do that after the, after the sermon. And then what I'm going to do for once is I'm going to um, close the service. I'm going to actually do the farewell and not leave you to do that on your own. But we have also listed in the order of service about five other songs. If you need to do a little more robust gospel singing, then you go right ahead and look up those links. And I encourage you to do so. Those were selected by uh, David Leffler and we're grateful to him for that as well. And he also writes up a little liturgy that goes with them. So very helpful in focusing us in on the key truth that we need to think about as we sing that song. So there we are with that. And uh, what we need to do now is open our Bibles, uh, would you open your Bibles with me to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1 verses 1 to 20, but 1 Samuel 1 is where we're at. And uh, again, I just want to say Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers, you know, you don't know how grateful we are for you. And maybe we don't show it like we should all the time. 
So we're sorry for that, but we don't know how grateful we are for you, especially us men and husbands. Amen? Men? I want to hear, see, see some of you say amen in the feed there. Um, yes, even though, listen to this here, just bear with me. Even though every woman was, a, you know, pardon me, even though the first woman was originally taken from the side of man back way back in the beginning, that is the first woman, like I said, after that, Every man comes from a woman. So do you hear that? The first woman does come from the first man, from his side. Whatever that means and however God did that, I don't know, but he did it. But then after that, every man is born from a woman. So we men are humbled and we're thankful for you. Without you mothers, we men would not be here. Our life wouldn't have gone anywhere without you. So we thank you. And to say, children, make sure you, you bless your, do what the proverb says, rise up and bless your mothers. Now, on another very difficult note, there are many women, uh, probably some tuned into this broadcast this morning, this live stream, who have suffered and are suffering the deep heartbreak of not being able to be a mother, to be the mother that you long to be. And a day like this is hard in you, and that is totally understandable. I do not want to undermine that yet. I want you women who do suffer to do a few things if you could. And this won't be an easy thing for you, but I want to encourage you uh, to do these things. Number one, you know, shift the focus to celebrating your own mother with great joy. Join the party. Yes, you can do this. You can, you can rejoice today by expressing gratitude to your mother for bringing you into the world so that you could meet and worship God with all your mind, heart, and life. So that is a major blessing to be thoroughly grateful for. You know, look at what you have been given in Christ and what you have been promised in Christ. Look at what he's done for you upon the cross. Look at what he's done for you in his sinless life. Uh, look at what he's already done in your heart as you believe and what he promises to do for you in the life to come and even in the here and now. So celebrate your mothers and be grateful. Uh, but what if your mother was not a good mother? What if that's another big point of pain for you? Uh, what if you never knew your mother? That's even harder. I can't imagine that. Well, I can't speak as a woman to uh, as a woman to her mother, but maybe I can speak as a man to his father. Maybe there's some sort of a parallel I can bring in here. I didn't have a good father growing up, to say the least. The first seven years of my life were a nightmare because of him. But in and through Christ, what Jesus has done in my life, I've been able to thoroughly forgive him to come to a place of being able to care for him in his old age, to really love him, and to be grateful for him. To be grateful that he helped bring me into this world so that I could meet and worship God. And for that, I am grateful. I love life, but more than that, I love the author and the giver of life, Jesus Christ. So therefore, I'm trying to say you can do this. You can join the party today. So I highly encourage you to do so. Um, The second thing I would like you to do is to celebrate your femininity, to celebrate your womanness, your womanhood, and that at heart you are a mother and that your motherly nurturing heart can, has, and will bless many, often without you even knowing that. So there is something to be grateful there uh, for there today as well, to focus on that. And I know it is not the same and I'm not pretending it is, but you can genuinely celebrate today in the very real anxiety, vexation, and grief you experience, and we all experience it, okay? We all have serious brokenness in our life, and though it can differ, and it does differ one from another, um, it is nonetheless brokenness that we grieve through. Uh, know that you are not in vain, for you are in Christ, and he is enough for you, and he will continue his work in you and through you. Worship Jesus not you know, worship Jesus and not what you are not able to have. That's the point here. Worship Jesus. I think of the story of, of Johnny Erickson, uh, from Johnny Erickson Tata's book, uh, When God Weeps. Uh, she speaks of this mission trip that she was a part of and that brought, that, that brought medical equipment to people in great physical poverty and need. She recounts the experience saying, Many showed up to the event uh, where, they were, where they were giving out this medical gear, wheelchairs, crutches, and the like. And it was a great time of joy and celebration by everyone for, you know, for what was being done, for this great blessing and meeting this great need. 
Uh, many, many crippled people showed up. By whatever means they could get there, they showed up. But there was not enough gear to go around, she says, and thus not everyone who came received something. Yet Johnny was blown away by those who did not receive uh, uh, she was blown away by those who did not receive and how they rejoiced and celebrated with those who did receive what they needed. They celebrated. They didn't go away sad going, I wish I could have that. They rejoiced and they celebrated. She says, that just blew her away. Now, early in my, my own Christian life, I struggled deeply with those who would share their testimonies of what God had done for them and in them. And, and, and I, had, I had this particular issue, you know, a big problem, and it still exists for me. It's not something that's been uh, resolved or dealt with. And I wondered why God wouldn't do for me as he had done for them. And so I, I found I just could not rejoice. I just felt grieved and upset and, and, and you know, vexated, so to speak, if that's even a word, and unless I just made up a word. And I didn't feel like a, a real human or a real man and that you know I was just not part of that somehow that I was off alone and somehow I was just different from everybody else then one day I realized that I needed to give that longing up to God so that he could do in me what he wanted to do in my life for his glory and also so that I no longer missed what he was already doing in me I was so fixated on this particular issue in my life this huge issue and it is a huge issue for me that I couldn't see what God wanted to do and I, and, and, and I couldn't see what he had already done. I couldn't really appreciate that or value that. And so I was missing out there. But I just came to this point saying, if you can do that in those people, what can you do in me? And I just want to give you the freedom, Lord, to do what you want to do. Not that he needs my permission, but uh, here I am relating to God and just giving him that permission. And so I found that I began to celebrate and rejoice with people when they shared their stories of what God was doing in their life. And I found that I also had many things to share as well that caused people to celebrate and to rejoice. And you can do this because Jesus is enough for you. And you don't want to miss what he's already doing in you. And uh, you can't be consumed with your problem in a way that separates and isolates you from everyone else as if you were different from everyone, for you are not. We are all broken sinners in need of a savior. Uh, the Apostle Paul speaks of those people who forgo marriage and childbearing who make themselves eunuchs so as to better serve Jesus' kingdom and mission. Think of Ananias and Sapphira. You can Google them and look them up in the book of Acts. Sure, many of them had the choice and you don't. It, it, you know, the choice was made for you. But you can accept this and know that God is sovereignly directing you for his glory and for your good, and definitely for the blessing of many others. So we are going to celebrate mothers today without apology, and we all should, but we don't want to do so without sensitivity. This is hard for you, and it was also hard for a woman named Hannah. So go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 1, and let's have a look at that. So as, you, as we come to... Uh, as we come to this uh, portion of God's story and of God's word, you know, we just kind of really, we enter into the midst of a very tumultuous stretch in Israel's history known as the Judges, uh, you know, of whom Samuel was the final judge leading into the era of the kings in Israel's history, into the monarchy, the establishing of that. And uh, it's here we meet Samuel's parents, Elkanah and uh, Hannah, and we read of Samuel's birth. His parents are godly worshipers of Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel, and uh, you know, faithful people amidst the cyclical corruption of religion and politics in the land of Israel. So they were in this up and down cycle where they would do great and then do horrible, going to exile, and it was an uh, and then God would they would cry out to God, He would bring them back, and it was ongoing cycle continuously of just ongoing cyclical corruption. And here you have this faithful family worshiping God in the midst of this in the land of Israel. And so look at me with, uh, listen, or read along with me as I, as I go to verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1 of 1 Samuel. And if you don't have a Bible or you're not sure what to do with one, just listen along. Uh, there was a certain man of Ramatham, Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroam, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, and Ephrathite. He had two wives. That already might get us thinking, okay, there might be an issue here. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children 
but Hannah had no children. So we can already suspect there may be some issues here, even in this being a godly household. So like I said, even though this is a godly household, is a godly family, it was not an altogether happy family. Uh, as among you know, other issues, one of Elkanah's wives, Hannah, could not bear him children. Um, it's clear from the unfolding narrative that Han Elkanah loved Hannah, but he had taken the second wife, who is Peninnah, so that she could bear him children that he needed. So having two wives is likely a sign of affluence and wealth in that culture. He could afford to do this. He had the resources to do so. And this man would want to preserve his estate and his name through his firstborn son. And God's law did permit this. And uh, so this is a strange cultural practice for us, uh, you know, and that's probably a huge understatement. And we don't have time to explain that and go into that today. Uh, maybe sometime we'll just slow down and go through First and Second Samuel ultra slow and look at all these things. But here's the situation. This was the culture. Let's not judge it right now. But the biblical text is setting us up for a very real case of infertility and jealousy in this household. And also how God works through even the bad to bring good for his people. So, you know, it might bear mentioning that also that in this time and in this place and in this culture... Uh, the woman's inability to bear children was viewed as a disgrace. So Hannah just took that as a disgrace upon her. It wasn't something that the culture necessarily forced on her. This is what she wanted, and to not have that. That's what she felt. Uh, so, but anyways, we're set up for a very difficult scene in the story. Yet at the same time, pardon me, at the same time, it is... Uh, it is key, in, uh, this, this very difficult scene that we're coming upon here in 1 Samuel it, it, it is key in God's unfolding, grand, redemptive plan, along with how our small life stories fit properly into his grand story. So that's really what we're going to be seeing here. That's the bigger picture. That's the uh, 20,000 foot, foot, foot view. So let's carry on in the story and read verses 3 to 8. Would you with me, please? Now this man, that was Elkanah, used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, uh, where, where the two sons of Eli, he was the temple priest at that time, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. So he treated her very, very fairly and very equi equitably as the law of God commanded him to do so for a second wife. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. The, the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. So this is something that's been going on for years, year after year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she re, uh, 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 as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. So this was her experience year after year, and it really hindered her worship of God big time. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, so he's consoling her at this, on this particular occasion. Maybe he did that every year, I don't know. But this particular year, he's trying to console her, and he says, and he says Hannah, why do you weep, and why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? And so... The rivalry we might have suspected in the opening two verses uh, between the two wives, uh, Peninnah and Hannah, is introduced here fully. Uh, like, like, like the text said, and we've already said, uh, Hannah is Elkanah's first wife whom he loves, but who is unable to bear him children. And Peninnah is his second wife whom he took to bear him children. Peninnah is jealous because ha Elkanah loves Hannah. And so... Peninnah uh, grievously provokes Hannah over, out of that jealousy, and Hannah is always and increasingly distressed over her infertility. And so what I want to do is just take a moment here and zero in and look just a little bit closer at how each of these women respectively react to their problem. Uh, first, we see Penina in her brokenness. She's experiencing brokenness in her life. She's experiencing, not experiencing the husband type of love that she is longing for. And so she's experiencing that brokenness and that pain. And in her brokenness, uh, she, she makes life a misery her, for her perceived rival. She's seeing Hannah as her rival and as her enemy of sorts. Uh, 
she's not seeing all that she's been given and all that she has. Her own, her son, uh, being the firstborn, uh, would in, would be the prime heir of all of Elkanah's estate. But that's not enough for her. She wants that first love of her husband. She's not receiving that. So here's what she's doing. She is making life a misery for Hannah. Second response we see that from Hannah in her brokenness, she goes to the throne of grace in prayer. So we see that in the unfolding story here. And the key that I want to pull out here is when something big is missing in your life is that the Lord God is still your all in all. That's key here. Just as Hannah is demonstrating for us, but Peninnah is not really demonstrating this for us. So you have to ask yourself, as you see these two examples, where do you want to land? Do you want to live in that kind of jealousy that makes you hate your rival and that's what your life is consumed with? Or do you want to worship God and make him your all in all, even in your pain and in the troubles and the trials of life? Which is better? Where do you want to land on that? Just think about that. Um, let's move on here and look at uh, verses uh, 9 to 11 with me, if you would. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah arose. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow. So really strong Hebrew language here. And I'm glad I'm reading from the English Standard Version, the ESV. And I'm glad that it brings that out and just doesn't collapse it into one word. Um, she, she vowed a vow. So we see that Hannah is coming to a place of just very, very deep, heartfelt seriousness. And, and she says, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. I get the impression this is the first time she's prayed like this and she's prayed a prayer like this. That's the impression I'm getting from the text here. And so Hannah's situation has been going on for years and the strain of it reaches new heights this particular uh, a year and um, you know particular heights of anguish for her uh, so great is her pain that she puts aside everything she's not interested in food or consolation but instead goes to the temple to pour her heart out to the lord her god and that speaks deeply to me. I don't know about you, but it should. It speaks deeply to me that in her great distress and anguish that she goes to the throne of grace and she pours her heart out to the Lord God. And she, I imagine she was praying in the temple every year, but there's something extra special and extra deep and important about this year. So ask yourself the question, where do you go when life is too much? What do you go to? I think we should take Hannah's example here and go to that throne of grace and just pour our hearts out to him. And it's also interesting, this is, this, as, we, as we look at verses 9 to 11, I think this is where Hannah undergoes a change by God's grace. Now, Hannah is already a believer. She's already among the, the elect. She is a beloved in Christ Jesus. But in her sanctification process, which we've been talking about uh, last Thursday night, in this process where God is transforming her more into the image and likeness that he wants her to be in, uh, she undergoes a big change by God's grace. And I think this just goes to show us that it's the hard times of life that are our opportunity for those deep changes that we really need. We wouldn't go there otherwise, but the hard times of life bring those issues in us out of the woodwork. We can't deny them. We can't hide them. They can't hide themselves. They just come out and they're there for us to see so that we can deal with them by God's grace. And this is where Hannah fully hands her issue over to the Lord. She is at the end of her rope. She knows that it's no longer about what she wants. Like This is going to kill her. She sees that. Uh, it's, it, it, it is about her. It is that. But it is first about the glory of God. And that's what we're seeing here in this narrative. This is where the situation goes from being about Hannah and her small story to God and his grand story and purpose in and through all things. And she now gets to submit herself fully and to have her story folded into God's big story properly. Hannah makes a vow that sets things straight in her heart that she wants to be used of God to glorify him in her, in her, in her womanhood as a mother. But that is now in his hands. She's given it over 
to the Lord. It's in his hands. She has wrung herself out and she has put it there. And so the stage is now set for one of those epic moments in God's story. The question that I believe the text would press upon us to ask is, what is God's plan? In those hard times, it's not like, God, what are you up to? It's like, God, what is your plan and how do I submit to that? What can I see? Help me to learn to submit to your plan. What is your plan? And we cannot confuse that. We cannot confuse God's plan with our plan. Often we do that. I'm guilty of that as much as the next. As I think I'm playing, praying for God's plan, but I'm actually praying for my plan and my purpose. And we cannot confuse his plan with ours, nor his purpose with ours, but we have to learn how to give way to his plan and his purpose. When our plans and our purposes are just not unfolding, they're not coming to fruition uh, like we thought they should, or, or, or maybe not at all, that is a time when we give way to his plan and to his purpose. And that's what Hannah is doing here for us. Just think uh, way ahead in the Bible storyline to uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth um, in Luke 1, 5 to 25. Uh, they gave birth to the forerunner to Jesus. Um, that would be John the Baptist. But maybe what we don't realize, and in, in, if we go and read that narrative in the first chapter of Luke, is that they could not have children. And they had no doubt prayed hard for children for years. Then they were old and very near retirement and had long given up on childbearing. What do we see though in the story? Yet they continued steadfastly in faith in the Lord their God. They continued to serve him faithfully, uh, above reproach, submitting to him and to his plan that this is not about them but about him and what he deems best. It was not hard for them to submit to God though it was hard for them to suffer infertility. Long after the dream faded, God grants it in his time and for his purpose. And this works out for their greater good, their greater joy, and also that of everyone else as well. And so what we need to understand here is that ever since Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve took that forbidden fruit, Whenever, you know, at that point when they declare saying, we can actually be God over our own lives. We can take that role. We don't need God to do this. He's holding that back from us. He's enslaving us in this, this garden, not realizing that it was a beautiful place to be. Um, but the, the serpent had deceived them and, they, and eating that fruit says, you can be your own God and you can determine what is right and wrong for yourself. You can determine what is good and bad and you can judge everything according to what you think. You can even judge God according to what you think. That was the lie of the serpent. You know, that, uh, you know, and ever since then, even as believers, even those who are in Christ Jesus are still struggling with us because we are not perfect yet. But our tendency ever since Genesis 3 has been to think that it's all about me, that God is there for me, that God revolves around me. And that only if I ask hard enough uh, that God should give me what I feel I need. If he doesn't, he's being unjust and unfair and unreasonable. And he may not be worthy of my worship or my love. That's the lie of Genesis 3. And Hannah makes a shift from that self-centeredness to God being God in her life. And that, she, and, the, and, the, and, the, and that should he answer her in the way that she is asking, that it would be for his glory and not for her mere personal fulfillment. This is a shift we all have to make. And we have to make it more than once in our lifetimes. Because life is going to continue to throw us curveballs. You know, life changes. We change and we forget who God is who does not change. And we've got to come back to this a time and time again. And so Hannah is making this shift. That is that work of grace that God is doing in her heart to make her from, I want this kid for me. I need this to be happy. To be like, I can be happy in God. Yes, I really want to be a mother, but I'm transferring this to you, God, for your glory now, should you decide to fulfill this prayer request of mine. And so that's what she does. She makes that transition in her heart. And she grows, makes a quantum leap of growth in her spiritual life here. And so read on with me here. Um, I'd love to break the, the, the last part of this chapter into two parts, but we're just going to read the rest of it and, uh, and, and walk through it the, the best we can. Uh, verse 12 to 20 of 1 Samuel 1 say, And as she, that is Han, you can, eh, Hannah, continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. Looks like in his old age, he was getting a bit soft and out of touch with what was going on here maybe, and uh, with the people. But Hannah answered, or no, he says to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. 
But Hannah answered, No, my lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, as some drunk. For all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman, that is Hannah, went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. She had given it over. They arose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. So she's worshipping again. Then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. So God has done just a great work in Hannah. You know, I just imagine that Hannah, like any young girl growing up, wants to be married and have children and to have a family, and that's what she fully expects. And she marries this great guy, Elkanah, and she can't have children. And I could see her just shattered by this long dream that she had. And now, and, and just having to come to terms with that and to give that dream over to God and let him answer it in the way that he saw fit. And it's a pretty amazing how he answered here. So God had brought Hannah to a place where she let him do a big work in her heart. He had already planned an eternity past to give Hannah children, but not until he had brought her to a place of being about him and not herself. Yes, even as believers, we need this. Otherwise, she would have likely interfered with God's plan for the life of the child he would bring into the world through her for his purpose. You know, how many of us parents interfere by not fully dedicating and offering our kids to God? How many of them kind of just hold them to ourself and, and we forget that they're supposed to be, be, they're supposed to be being formed into the image and likeness of Jesus, but we're making them more into the image and likeness of ourselves? Not so cool, not so good. How many of us do that? Yes, I've done that. Okay, so we need to be aware of that. When Hannah got up from wrestling deeply with her God, she knew she had given it over to him and that he would do what was truly best and that his purposes would never be thwarted. She was at peace for the first time in years. Did you hear that? After this prayer, Hannah got up and she resumed worship like she hadn't in years. She was eating again. She was at peace for the first time in many years. God answers Hannah's prayer for his glory, her joy, and the good of all. That is what Samuel's name means, heard by God. Names really meant something in that ancient culture. Uh, people were often named in connection with an important event or an action. But the point is, she had utterly wrung herself out in prayer to the Lord her God, putting her desires, longings, and wants into his hands. Did you hear that? The point here is that she had come to a place of just utterly wringing herself out in prayer to the Lord her God. Just like I just squeezed every last little bit out before him, put it all before him. All of her desires, all of her longings and wants are in his hands now. And looking ahead, you know, she gets the answer to the prayer that she's looking for. And uh, looking ahead, Hannah makes good on her vow to the Lord. As soon as Samuel is weaned as a young boy, I don't know how old that would have been. Would have been four, five, or six. I don't know, three to four. I, I don't know. I know there's some people that don't wean their kids till they're like eight or nine or ten. I think that's a bit long. That's just my opinion. I hope I don't get in trouble for that. But anyways, uh, she, once she weans him, she brings him into the temple and leaves him there only to see him once per year after that. And she was fulfilled in a way that she could not imagine. And Samuel became a hero of the faith and how he led Israel and transitioned the nation uh, to a monarchy. And so make good on what you have been given, whatever it is that you have. However small you think it is, it's important. It's a gift of God to be used for his glory. And remember that what you have is not for you, but it is for the Lord. So Hannah makes good on that. So what do we have by the end of the story? We have a happy ending. Yeah, who praise the Lord? This is a happy ending. But how many people don't get what they've asked the Lord for? Many don't. 
We would be tempted to say that it was not a happy ending for them. Yet, in God's plan and His purpose, you know, it's always a happy ending because the gift of God Himself to His people, to all who receive Him, is enough. And we can go on, and we can go and wring our hearts out before the throne of grace, and we can give up all of our issues to Him, and we can learn to be at peace in Him, to be free in Him. And to still be folded into his big story and to play our part, whatever that part may be. Don't look at what you don't have, but look at what you do have in Christ Jesus. Look at who Jesus is. Look at what Jesus has done for you and what he is going to do for you. And ask how you can best be used for his glory, which will result in your joy and the joy of others. And just remember, something very important to remember here. You are not the main character in your little story. God is the main character in your little story. You were made for His glory, and that is where your true joy and fulfillment is. This is the best place to be. This is the only place to be. You can always pray and hope, as did Hannah. I can, we all can. Hannah is a prime example of discipleship and prayer that all, all men and women can connect with and follow. Your prayers may well be answered, you know, may, may, and they will be answered in God's own way and in God's own time. It just may be nothing like you expected or wanted. Um, what if uh, what you get is not what you wanted? Can you still be who you are? Uh, can God still work th- through you for his glory? Uh, can God, you know, is God himself not still enough for you in that? Uh, do you think whatever it is that you want, you need that to be complete? Well, it is Jesus who makes you complete. It is the fullness of God in Christ that fulfills you. And the fact that he went and he died for all your sin, and he gives you eternal life, which is to know the living God. And that is the treasure of all treasures. We are running short on time here, and we need to move forward. Let me just wrap this up here this this morning. Uh, another time we'll break down First Samuel and just take forever to do it, and that'll be a lot of fun. But therefore, we celebrate you mothers today. We celebrate all you women. We celebrate because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and has promised us himself. And he has also promised to deliver us from this evil, broken world of pain, loss, grief, and death. We are part of birthing and, you know, we get to be part of birthing new people into his church and his kingdom through his name and in the power of his spirit. And this is something we can all celebrate together as we highlight our mothers. And so what I'd like to do here is mute myself for a few minutes. And I would like to play a Mother's Day video for you. Motherhood plays an important role in the Bible. It binds the beginning and the end. These stories offer us a glimpse into the heart of God, and so we start at the beginning. Taken from the side of Adam, gifted with bringing forth life, the first woman was named Eve because she was the mother of all living. But she was also a mother in her own right, the first of many mothers to come. Though Sarah's womb was closed, God promised nations and kings would come from her Ten years pass, and motherhood seems as impossible as the day it was promised. But the Lord is faithful to keep his promises, and Sarah bore a son who made her laugh. Leah was the firstborn, overlooked by her husband Jacob, who gave his heart to her younger sister. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. Despite Jacob's disdain, she found her motherhood in the Lord. When Pharaoh became angry at the fruitfulness of the Hebrews, Jochebed sacrificed her motherhood for the sake of her son. When Pharaoh's daughter saw the child, she had compassion on him. Because of Jochebed's sacrificial motherhood, the Israelites found freedom. Naomi was a mother who experienced the loss of her sons, yet she gained a daughter in Ruth who declared, for where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Naomi and Ruth became family by faith. Mary, a virgin and not yet married, 
was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. The motherhood of this blessed woman was more than the continuation of a family name, but a means for God to bring a savior into the world to save his people from their sins. From the garden to the cross, there have always been mothers. These women paved the way for all women, representing the full spectrum of the ways one could be called mom. Whether a mother in faith, mentorship, adoption, or by birth, you play an important role in the stories of generations to come. To all the Sarahs, Leahs, Jochebeds, and Naomis, Happy Mother's Day. Well, I hope you uh, found that uh, video helpful and inspiring and encouraging to you. This is the time here where we're gonna try that special new uh, feature for our live stream, which is uh, we're gonna play a song here uh, done by David and Katrina uh, Leffelar. And uh, so this is the time where you need to look up those lyrics for the steadfast love of the Lord. So I'll just give you a moment to do that. And uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll feed this song into the live stream so you'll be able to hear it, but you'll also need the lyrics. And like I said, some of you may know this by heart, but just think about the, the lyrics of the steadfast love of the Lord, whatever it is that you're facing and going, going through. Uh, just think about what these lyrics are saying, what they're speaking into your heart and your soul, your mind and into your life. So I'm going to pull that song up right now. So I hope you have the lyrics up and uh, that you can sing along and enjoy this song together. And uh, we'll be looking for a little bit of feedback on how it's going. But at the same time, just remember this is done with an iPhone. So, and I think they did a marvelous job for a first kick at the can. Okay, well, I hope you found that uh, song as much of a blessing as I found it and that it touched your hearts and focused you where you need to be focused. So what I'm going to do now is just enter into the farewell and the closing of this worship service as Kennard Park Community Church. And feel free after this to go to the songs that have been provided by the Leffelars as well to continue some robust gospel singing as you'll probably need to do a little more than that. 
and uh, beautifully done, uh, says Val, David, and Katrina. So yeah, great job. Uh, let me read to you this closing reading. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather and to worship a very hard and difficult, challenging message for all of us, but especially for those women who do struggle at this time of the year greatly, that you would fill their hearts with your love, your compassion, your peace, and your hope, and your promise to them. And Father, we just thank you for our mothers. We celebrate them. We're grateful that you use them to bring us into the world, to nurture us and, uh, and care for us and bring us up and to present us before the Lord. We thank you that we have been able to come into the world through them and to meet our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray, Father. Amen. So now go and be who you are as God's people today and throughout this week. Amen.